Act One of the Misanthrope by Moliere, translated by Henri van Luan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Alceste. In love with Salimene. Read by Nima. Philint, his friend. Read by Todd. Orant. In love with Salimene. Read by Amal Napstone. Selimen. Beloved by Alceste. Read by Lian Yao. Iliant, her cousin. Read by Sonia. Arsinoe. Salimene's friend. Read by Eva Davis. Acast. Marquis. Read by Thomas Peter. Clitander. Marquis. Read by Sean Lally. Basque. Servant to Salemine. Read by Paul. Dubois. Servant to Alceste. Read by Recording Person. An Officer of the Marie Chaussee. Read by Roger Moline. Stage Directions. Read by K. Hand. Scene. At Paris. In Salemine's House. Act One. Scene One. Felinte Alceste. What is the matter? What ails you? Alceste, seated. Leave me, I pray. But, once more, tell me what strange whim. Leave me, I tell you, and get out of my sight. But you might at least listen to people without getting angry. I choose to get angry and I do not choose to listen. I do not understand you in these abrupt moods, and although we are friends, I am the first. Alceste, rising quickly. I, your friend? Lay not that flattering unction to your soul. I have until now professed to be so, but after what I have just seen of you, I tell you candidly that I am such no longer I have no wish to occupy a place in a corrupt heart. I am then very much to be blamed from your point of view, Alceste? To be blamed? You ought to die from very shame. There is no excuse for such behavior, and every man of honor must be disgusted at it. I see you almost stifle a man with caresses. Show him the most ardent affection and overwhelm him with protestations, offers, and vows of friendship. Your ebullitions of tenderness know no bounds, and when I ask you who that man is, you can scarcely tell me his name. Your feelings for him the moment you've turned your back suddenly cool. You speak of him most indifferently to me. Zounds! I call it unworthy, base, and infamous so far to demean one's self as to act contrary to one's own feelings and if unfortunately i had done such a thing i should go that very instant and hang myself out of sheer vexation i do not see that it is a hanging matter at all and i beg of you not to think it amiss if i ask you to show me some mercy for i shall not hang myself if it be all the same to you that is a sorry joke but seriously what would you have people do i would have people be sincere and that like men of honour no word be spoken that comes not from the heart when a man comes and embraces you warmly you must pay him back in his own coin respond as best you can to his show of feeling and return offer for offer and vow for vow not so i cannot bear so base a method which your fashionable people generally affect there is nothing i detest so much as the contortions of these great time and lip servers these affable dispensers of meaningless embraces these obliging utterers of empty words who vie with every one in civilities and treat the man of worth and the fop alike. What good does it do 
a man heaps endearments on you vows that he is your friend that he believes in you is full of zeal for you esteems and loves you and lauds you to the skies when he rushes to do the same to the first rapscallion he meets no 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 heart with the least self-respect cares for esteem so prostituted he will hardly relish it even when openly expressed when he finds that he shares it with the whole universe preference must be based on esteem and to esteem everyone is to esteem no one as you abandon yourself to the vices of the times zounds you are not the man for me i decline this over-complacent kindness which uses no discrimination i like to be distinguished and to cut the matter short the friend of all mankind is no friend of mine but when we are of the world we must conform to the outward civilities which custom demands i deny it we ought to punish pitilessly that shameful pretense of friendly intercourse i like a man to be a man and to show on all occasions the bottom of his heart in his discourse let that be the thing to speak and never let our feelings be hidden beneath vain compliments there are many cases in which plain speaking would become ridiculous and could hardly be tolerated and with all due allowances for your unbending honesty it is as well to conceal your feelings sometimes would it be right or decent to tell thousands of people what we think of them and when we meet with someone who we hate or who displeases us must we tell him so openly yes what would you tell old Amelia that it ill becomes her to set up for a beauty at her age, and that the paint she uses disgusts every one? Undoubtedly. Or Dorillus, that he is a bore, and that there is no one at court who is not sick of hearing him boast of his courage and the luster of his house? Decidedly so. You are jesting. I am not jesting at all and i would not spare any one in that respect it offends my eyes too much and whether at court or in town i behold nothing but what provokes my spleen i become quite melancholy and deeply grieved to see men behave to each other as they do everywhere i find nothing but base flattery injustice self-interest deceit roguery i cannot bear it any longer i'm furious and my intention is to break with all mankind this philosophical spleen is somewhat too savage i cannot but laugh to see you in these gloomy fits and fancy that i perceive in us two brought up together the two brothers described in the school for husbands who good heavens drop your insipid comparisons nay seriously leave off these vagaries the world will not alter for all your meddling and as plain speaking has such charms for you i shall tell you frankly that this complaint of yours is as good as a play wherever you go and that all those invectives against the manners of the age make you a laughing-stock to many people so much the better zounds so much the better that is just what i want it is a very good sign and i rejoice at it all men are so odious to me that i should be sorry to appear rational in their eyes but do you wish harm to all mankind yes i have conceived a terrible hatred for them shall all poor mortals without exception be included in this aversion there are some even in the age in which we live no they are all alike and i hate all men some because they're wicked and mischievous others because they lend themselves to the wicked and have not that healthy contempt with which vice ought to inspire all virtuous minds you can see how unjustly and excessively complacent people are to that barefaced scoundrel with whom i am at law 
you may plainly perceive the traitor through his mask. He's well known everywhere in his true colors. His rolling eyes and his honeyed tones impose only on those who do not know him. People are aware that this low-bred fellow, who deserves to be pilloried, has, by the dirtiest jobs, made his way in the world, and that the splendid position he has acquired makes merit repine and virtue blush. Yet whatever dishonorable epithets may be launched against him everywhere, nobody defends his wretched honor. Call him a rogue, an infamous wretch, a confounded scoundrel if you like, and all the world will say yea, and no one contradicts you. But for all that, his bowing and scraping are welcome everywhere. He's received, smiled upon, and wriggles himself into all kinds of society. And if any appointment is to be secured by intriguing, he will carry the day over a man of the greatest worth. Zounds! These are mortal stabs to me, to see vice parlayed with, and sometimes I feel suddenly inclined to fly into a wilderness far from the approach of men. Great heaven! Let us torment ourselves a little less about the vices of our age, and be a little more lenient to human nature. Let us not scrutinize it with the utmost severity, but look with some indulgence at its failings. In society, we need virtue to be more pliable. If we are too wise, we may be equally to blame. Good sense avoids all extremes, and requires us to be soberly rational. This unbending and virtuous stiffness of ancient times shocks too much the ordinary customs of our own. It requires too great perfection from us mortals. We must yield to the times without being too stubborn. It is the height of folly to busy ourselves in correcting the world. I, as well as yourself, notice a hundred things every day which might be better managed, differently enacted. But whatever I may discover at any moment, people do not see me in a rage like you. I take men quietly, just as they are. I accustom my mind to bear with what they do. And I believe that at court, as well as in the city, my phlegm is as philosophical as your bile. But this phlegm, good sir, you who reason so well, could it not be disturbed by anything? And if perchance a friend should betray you, if he forms a subtle plot to get a hold of what is yours, if people should try to spread evil reports about you, would you tamely submit to all this without flying into a rage? I, I look upon all these faults of which you complain as vices inseparably connected with human nature. In short, my mind is no more shocked at seeing a man a rogue, unjust, or selfish, than at seeing vultures eager for prey, mischievous apes, or fury-lashed wolves. What? I should see myself deceived? Torn to pieces, robbed without being? Zounds! I shall say no more about it. All this reasoning is full of impertinence. Upon my word, you would do well to keep silence. Rail a little less at your opponent, and attend a little more to your suit. That I shall not do. That is settled long ago. But whom, then, do you expect to solicit for you? Whom? Reason. My just right. Equity. Shall you not pay a visit to any of the judges? No. Is my cause unjust or dubious? I am agreed on that. But you know what harm intrigues do, and— No. I am resolved not to stir a step. I am either right or wrong. Do not trust in that. I shall not budge an inch. Your opponent is powerful, and by his underhand work may induce— It does not matter. You will make a mistake. Be it so. I wish to see the end of it. But— I shall have the satisfaction of losing my suit. But after all— I shall see by this trial whether men have sufficient impudence 
are wicked, villainous, and perverse enough to do me this injustice in the face of the whole world. <sighs> what a strange fellow. I could wish, were it to cost me ever so much, that, for the fun of the thing, I lost my case. But people will really laugh at you, Alceste, if they hear you go on in this fashion. <laughs> so much the worse for those who will. But this rectitude, which you exact so carefully in every case, this absolute integrity in which you entrench yourself, do you perceive it in the lady you love? As for me, I am astonished that, appearing to be at war with the whole human race, you yet, notwithstanding everything that can render it odious to you, have found aught to charm your eyes. And what surprises me still more is the strange choice your heart has made. The sincere Eliant has a liking for you. The prude Arsenio looks with favor upon you, yet your heart does not respond to their passion. Whilst you wear the chains of Silamen, who sports with you, and whose coquettish humor and malicious wit seems to accord so well with the manner of the times. How comes it that, hating these things as mortally as you do, you endure so much of them in that lady? Are they no longer faults in so sweet a charmer? Do not you perceive them? Or if you do, do you excuse them? Not so. The love I feel for this young widow does not make me blind to her faults. And, notwithstanding, the great passion with which she has inspired me, I am the first to see as well as to condemn them. But for all this, do what I will. I confess my weakness. She has the art of pleasing me. In vain I see her faults. I may even blame them. In spite of all, she makes me love her. Her charms conquer everything. And, no doubt, my sincere love will purify our heart from the vices of our times. If you accomplish this, it will be no small task. Do you believe yourself beloved by her? Yes, certainly. I should not love her at all, did I not think so. But if her love for you is so apparent, how comes it that your rivals cause you so much uneasiness? It is because a heart, deeply smitten, claims all to itself. I come here only with the intention of telling her what, on this subject, my feelings dictate. Had I but to choose, her cousin Eliant would have all my love. Her heart, which values yours, is stable and sincere, and this more compatible choice would have suited you better. It is true. My good sense tells me so every day. But good sense does not always rule love. Well, I fear much for your affections, and the hope which you cherish may perhaps... Scene two, Orante, Alceste, Felinte. Orante, to Alceste. I have been informed yonder that Eliant and Selimain have gone out to make some purchases. But as I heard that you were here, I came to tell you most sincerely that I have conceived the greatest regard for you, and that, for a long time, this regard has inspired me with the most ardent wish to be reckoned among your friends. Yes, I like to do homage to merit, and I am most anxious that a bond of friendship should unite us. I suppose that a zealous friend, and of my standing, is not altogether to be rejected. All this time Alceste has been musing, and seems not to be aware that Arante is addressing him. He looks up only when Arante says to him, It is to you, if you please, that this speech is addressed. To me, sir. To you. Is it in any way offensive to you? Not in the least. 
but my surprise is very great and i did not expect that honour the regard in which i hold you ought not to astonish you and you can claim it from the whole world sir our whole kingdom contains nothing above the dazzling merit which people discover in you sir yes for my part i prefer you to the most important in it sir may heaven strike me dead if i lie and to convince you on this very spot of my feelings allow me sir to embrace you with all my heart and to solicit a place in your friendship your hand if you please will you promise me your friendship sir what you refuse me sir you do me too much honour but friendship is a sacred thing and to lavish it on every occasion is surely to profane it judgment and choice should preside at such a compact we ought to know more of each other before engaging ourselves and it may happen that our dispositions are such that we may both of us repent of our bargain upon my word that is wisely said and i esteem you all the more for it let us therefore leave it to time to form such a pleasing bond but meanwhile i am entirely at your disposal if you have any business at court every one knows how well i stand with the king i have his private ear and upon my word he treats me in everything with the utmost intimacy in short i am yours in every emergency and as you are a man of brilliant parts and to inaugurate our charming amity i come to read you a sonnet which i made a little while ago and to know whether it be good enough for publicity i am not fit sir to decide such a matter you will therefore excuse me why so <sighs> i have the failing of being a little more sincere in those things than is necessary the very thing i ask and i should have reason to complain if in laying myself open to you that you might give me your frank opinion you should deceive me and disguise anything from me if that be the case sir i'm perfectly willing sonnet uh, it, it is a sonnet hope it is to a lady who flattered my passion with some hope hope they are not long pompous verses but mild tender and melting little lines at every one of these interruptions he looks at alceste we shall see hope i, I do not know whether the style will strike you as sufficiently clear and easy and whether you will approve my choice of words we shall soon see sir besides you must know that i was only a quarter of an hour in composing it let us hear sir the time signifies nothing orante reads hope it is true oft gives relief rocks for a while are tedious pain but what a poor advantage phyllis when naught remains and all is gone i am already charmed with this little bit alceste softly to felinte what do you mean to tell me that you like this stuff you once had some complacency but less would have sufficed you should not take that trouble to give me naught but hope 
In what pretty terms these thoughts are put! How now, you vile flatterer! You praise this rubbish! If I must wait eternally, my passion, driven to extremes, will fly to death. Your tender cares cannot prevent this. Fair Phyllis, I were in despair, when we must hope for ever. The conclusion is pretty, amorous, admirable. A plague on that conclusion. I wish you'd had concluded to break your nose, you poisoner to the devil. I never heard verses more skillfully turned. Zones. Orante to Felinte. You flatter me. You are under the impression, perhaps. No, I am not flattering at all. What else are you doing, you wretch? Orante to Alceste. But for you, you know our agreement. Speak to me, I pray, with all sincerity. These matters, sir, are always more or less delicate, and every one is fond of being praised for his wit. But I was saying one day to a certain person, who shall be nameless, when he showed me some of his verses, that a gentleman ought at all times to exercise a great control over that itch for writing which sometimes attacks us, and should keep a tight rein over the strong propensity which one has to display such amusements, and that, in the frequent anxiety to show their productions, people are frequently exposed to act a very foolish part. Do you wish to convey to me by this that I am wrong in desiring... I do not say that, exactly. But I told him that writing without warmth becomes a bore, that there needs no other weakness to disgrace a man, that even if people, on the other hand, had a hundred good qualities, we view them from their worst sides. Do you find anything to object to in my sonnet? I do not say that, but to keep him from writing, I set before his eyes how in our days that desire has spoiled a great many very worthy people. Do I write badly? Am I like them in any way? I do not say that. But in short, I said to him, What pressing need is there for you to rhyme? And what the deuce drives you into print? If we can pardon the sending into the world of a badly written book, it will only be in those unfortunate men who write for their livelihood. Believe me, resist your temptations, keep these effusions from the public, and do not, how much soever you may be asked, forfeit the reputation which you enjoy at court, of being a man of sense and a gentleman, to take from the hands of a greedy printer that of a ridiculous and wretched author. That is what I tried to make him understand. This is all well and good, and I seem to understand you, but I should like to know what there is in my sonnet to— Candidly, you had better put it in your closet. You've been following bad models, and your expressions are not at all natural. Pray, what is— Rocks for a while are tedious pain, and what— when naught remains, and all is gone. What? You should not take that trouble to give me naught but hope? And what? Phyllis, I were in despair, when we must hope forever? This figurative style that people are so vain of is beside all good taste and truth. It is only a play upon words, sheer affectation, and it is not thus that nature speaks. The wretched taste of the age is what I dislike in this. Our forefathers, unpolished as they were, had a much better one, and I value all that is admired nowadays, far less than an old song which I am going to repeat to you. Had our great monarch 
granted me his Paris large and fair, and I straightway must quit for I, the love of my true dear. Then would I say, King Hall, I pray, take back your Paris fair. I love much more, my dear, I trow. I love much more, my dear. This versification is not rich, and the style is antiquated. But do you not see that it is far better than all those trumpery trifles against which good sense revolts? And that in this, passion speaks from the heart. Had our great monarch granted me his Paris large and fair, and I straightway must quit for I, the love of my true dear. Then would I say, King Hall, I pray, take back your Paris fair. I love much more, my dear, I trow. I love much more, my dear. This is what a really loving heart would say. To Falinte, who is laughing. Yes, Master Wag, in spite of all your wit, I care more for this than for all the florid pomp and the tinsel which everybody is admiring nowadays. And I, I maintain that my verses are very good. Doubtless you have your reason for thinking them so, but you will allow me to have mine which, with your permission, will remain independent. It is enough for me that others prize them. That is because they know how to dissemble, which I do not. Do you really believe that you have such a great share of wit? If I praised your verses, I should have more. I shall do very well without your approbation. You will have to do without it, if it be all the same. I should like much to see you compose some on the same subject, just to have a sample of your style. I might, perchance, make some as bad, but I should take good care not to show them to any one. You are mightily positive, and this great sufficiency... Pray, seek someone else to flatter you and not me. But, my little sir, drop this haughty tone. In truth, my big sir, I shall do as I like. Flinte, coming between them. Stop, gentlemen. That is carrying the matter too far. Cease, I pray. Oh, I am wrong, I confess. And I leave the field to you. I am your servant, sir, most heartily. And I, sir, am your most humble servant. Scene 3. Felinte Alceste. Well, you see, by being too sincere, you have got a nice affair on your hands. I saw that Orant, in order to be flattered... Do not talk to me. But... No more society for me. Is it too much? Leave me alone. If I... Not another word. But what? I will hear no more. But... Again? People insult... Ah, zounds, this is too much. Do not dog my steps. You are making fun of me. I shall not leave you. End of Act One Act Two of The Misanthrope by Moliere Translated by Henri von Luan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One Alceste, Solemne. Will you have me speak candidly to you, madam? Well then, I am very much dissatisfied with your behavior. Very angry when I think of it and I perceive that we shall have to break with each other. Yes, I should only deceive you 
were I to speak otherwise, sooner or later a rupture is unavoidable, and if I were to promise the contrary a thousand times, I should not be able to bear this any longer. Oh, I see. It is to quarrel with me that you wish to conduct me home. I do not quarrel, but your disposition, madam, is too ready to give any first comer an entrance into your heart. Too many admirers beset you, and my temper cannot put up with that. Am I to blame for having too many admirers? Can I prevent people from thinking me amiable? And am I to take a stick to drive them away when they endeavour by tender means to visit me? <laughs> no, madam, there is no need for a stick, but only a heart less yielding and less melting at their love-tales. I am aware that your good looks accompany you, go where you will, but your reception retains those whom your eyes attract, and that gentleness, accorded to those who surrender their arms, finishes on their hearts the sway which your charms began. The too agreeable expectation which you offer them increases their assiduities towards you, and your complacency, a little less extended, would drive away the great crowd of so many admirers. But tell me, at least, madam, by what good fortune Clotande has the happiness of pleasing you so mightily? Upon what basis of merit and sublime virtue do you ground the honour of your regard for him? Is it by the long nail of his little finger that he has acquired the esteem which you display for him? Are you, like all the rest of the fashionable world, fascinated by the dazzling merit of his fair wig? Do his great rolls make you love him? Do his many ribbons charm you? Is it by the attraction of his large Rhinegrave that he has conquered your heart, whilst at the same time he pretended to be your slave? Or have his manner of smiling and his falsetto voice found out the secret of moving your feelings? How unjustly you take umbrage at him! Do not you know why I countenance him, and that he has promised to interest all his friends in my lawsuit? Lose your lawsuit, madam, with patience, and do not countenance a rival whom I detest. But you are getting jealous of the whole world! It is because the whole world is so kindly received by you. That is the very thing to calm your frightened mind, because my goodwill is diffused over all. You would have more reason to be offended if you saw me entirely occupied with one. But as for me, whom you accuse of too much jealousy, what have I more than any of them, madam, pray? The happiness of knowing that you are beloved. And what grounds has my love-sick heart for believing it? I think that, as I have taken the trouble to tell you so, such an avowal ought to satisfy you. But who will assure me that you may not, at the same time, say as much to everybody else, perhaps? Certainly, for a lover, this is a pretty amorous speech, and you make me out a very nice lady. Well... To remove such a suspicion, I retract this moment everything I have said, and no one but yourself shall for the future impose upon you. Will that satisfy you? Zounds, why do I love you so? Ah, <sighs> if ever I get heart whole out of your hands, I shall bless heaven for this rare good fortune. I make no secret of it. I do all that is possible to tear this unfortunate attachment from my heart, but hitherto my greatest efforts have been of no avail, and it is for my sins that I love you thus. It is very true that your affection for me is unequalled. As for that, I can challenge the whole world. My love for you cannot be conceived, and never, madam. Has any man loved as I do? 
Your method, however, is entirely new, for you love people only to quarrel with them. It is in peevish expressions alone that your feelings vent themselves. No one ever saw such grumbling swain. But it lies with you alone to dissipate this ill humour. For mercy's sake, let us make an end of all these bickerings, deal openly with each other, and try to put a stop. Scene 2. Solemne Alceste Basque. What is the matter? A cast is below. Very well. Bid him come up. Scene 3. Solemne Alceste. What? Can one never have a little private conversation with you? You are always ready to receive company, and you cannot for a single instant make up your mind to be not at home. Do you wish me to quarrel with a cast? You have such regard for people which I by no means like. He is a man never to forgive me if he knew that his presence could annoy me. And what is that to you? To inconvenience yourself so? But good heaven! The amity of such as he is of importance. They are a kind of people who, I do not know how, have acquired the right to be heard at court. They take their part in every conversation. They can do you no good, but they may do you harm. And, whatever support one may find elsewhere, it will never do to be on bad terms with those very noisy gentry. In short, whatever people may say or do, you always find reasons to bear with every one, and your very careful judgment. Scene 4. Alceste, Salemine, Basque. Cotandre is here too, madame. Exactly so. Wishes to go. Where are you running to? I am going. Stay. For what? Stay. I cannot. I wish it. I will not. These conversations only worry me, and it is too bad of you to wish me to endure them. Oh, I wish it. I wish it. No. It is impossible. Very well, then. Go. Be gone. You can do as you like. Scene 5. Eliante, Felinte, Acaste, Clitandre, Alceste, Salemine, Basque. Eliante to Salemine. He are the two Marquis coming up with us. Has anyone told you? Yes. To Basque. Place chairs for everyone. Basque places chairs and exit. To Alceste. You are not gone? No, but I am determined, madam, to have you make up your mind either for them or for me. Hold your tongue. This very day you shall explain yourself. You are losing your senses. Not at all. You shall declare yourself. Indeed. You must take your stand. You are jesting, I believe. Not so. But you must choose. I have been too patient. Egad! I've just come from the Louvre, where Clayant at the Levy made himself very ridiculous. Has he not some friend who could charitably enlighten him upon his manners? Truth to say, he compromises himself very much in society. Everywhere he carries himself with an air that is noticed at first sight. And when, after a short absence, you meet him again, he is still more absurd than ever. Egad! Talk of absurd people just now. One of the most tedious ones has annoyed me. That reasoner, Damon, kept me, if you please, for a full hour in the broiling sun, away from my sedan chair. He is a strange talker, and one who always finds the means of telling you nothing with a great flow of words. There is no sense at all in his tittle-tattle, and all that we hear is but noise. Eliante to Felinte. This beginning is not bad, and the conversation takes a sufficiently agreeable turn against our neighbours. Timon's too, madam, is another original. 
he is a complete mystery from top to toe who throws upon you in passing a bewildered glance and who without having anything to do is always busy whatever he utters is accompanied with grimaces he quite oppresses people by his ceremonies to interrupt a conversation he has always a secret to whisper to you and that secret turns out to be nothing of the merest molehill he makes a mountain and whispers everything in your ear even to a good day and gerald madame that tiresome story-teller he never comes down from his nobleman's pedestal he continually mixes with the best society and never quotes any one of minor rank than a duke prince or princess rank is his hobby and his conversation is of nothing but horses carriages and dogs he these and thous persons of the highest standing and the word sir is quite obsolete with him it is said that he is on the best of terms with belize oh, poor silly women and the dreariest company when she comes to visit me i suffer from martyrdom one has to rack one's brains perpetually to find out what to say to her and the impossibility of her expressing her thoughts allows the conversation to drop every minute in vain you try to overcome her stupid silence by the assistance of the most commonplace topics even the fine weather the rain the heat and the cold are subjects which with her are soon exhausted yet for all that her calls unbearable enough are prolonged to an insufferable length and you may consult the clock or yawn twenty times but she stirs no more than a log of wood what think you of it rust oh what excessive pride he is a man positively puffed out with conceit his self-importance is never satisfied with the court against which he inveighs daily and whenever an office a place or a living is bestowed on another he is sure to think himself unjustly treated but young cleon whom the most respectable people go to see what say you of him that it is to his cook he owes his distinction and to his table that people pay visits he takes pains to provide the most dainty dishes true but i should be glad if he would not dish up himself his foolish person is a very bad dish which to my thinking spoils every entertainment which he gives his uncle damis is very much esteemed what say you to him madam he is one of my friends i think him a perfect gentleman and sensible enough true but he pretends to too much wit which annoys me he is always upon stilts and in all his conversations one sees him labouring to say smart things since he took it into his head to be clever he is so difficult to please that nothing suits his taste he must needs find mistakes in everything that one writes and thinks that to bestow praise does not become a wit that to find fault shows learning that only fools admire and laugh and that by not approving of anything in the works of our time he is superior to all other people even in conversations he finds something to cavil at the subjects are too trivial for his condescension and with arms crossed in his breast he looks down from the height of his intellect with pity on what every one says drat it his very picture you have an admirable knack of portraying people to the life capital go on my fine courtly friends you spare no one and every one will have his turn nevertheless let but any one of those persons appear and we shall see you rush to meet him offer him your hand and with a flattering kiss give weight to your protestations of being his servant <laughs> why this to us if what is said offends you the reproach must be addressed to this lady no gadzooks it concerns you for your assenting smiles draw from her wit all these slanderous remarks her satirical vein is incessantly recruited by the culpable incense of your flattery and her mind would find fewer charms in raillery if she discovered that no one applauded her thus it is that to flatterers we ought everywhere to impute the vices which are sown among mankind 
but why do you take so great an interest in those people for you would condemn the very things that are blamed in them and is not this gentleman bound to contradict would you have him subscribe to the general opinion and must he not everywhere display the spirit of contradiction with which heaven has endowed him other people's sentiments can never please him he always supports a contrary idea and he would think himself too much of the common herd were he observed to be of any one's opinion but his own the honour of gainsaying has so many charms for him that he very often takes up the cudgels against himself he combats his own sentiments as soon as he hears them from other folks lips in short madam the laughers are on your side and you may launch your satire against me but it is very true too that you always take up arms against everything that is said and that your avowed spleen cannot bear people to be praised or blamed Sadeth, spleen against mankind is always seasonable because they are never in the right and i see that in all their dealings they either praise impertinently or censure rashly but no madam no though i were to die for it you have pastimes which i cannot tolerate and people are very wrong to nourish in your heart this great attachment to the very faults which they blame in you as for myself i do not know but i openly acknowledge that hitherto i have thought this lady faultless i see that she is endowed with charms and attractions but the faults which she has have not struck me so much the more have they struck me and far from appearing blind she knows that i take care to reproach her with them the more we love any one the less we ought to flatter her true love shows itself by overlooking nothing and were i a lady i would banish all those mean-spirited lovers who submit to all my sentiments in whose mild complacencies every moment offer up incense to my vagaries in short if hearts were ruled by you we ought to love well to relinquish all tenderness and make it the highest aim of perfect attachment to rail heartily at the persons we love <laughs> love generally speaking is little apt to put up with these decrees and lovers are always observed to extol their choice their passion never sees aught to blame in it and in the beloved all things become lovable they think their faults perfections and invent sweet terms to call them by the pale one vies with the jasmine in fairness another dark enough to frighten people becomes an adorable brunette the lean one has a good shape and is lithe the stout one has a portly and majestic bearing the slattern who has few charms passes under the name of a careless beauty the giantess seems a very goddess in their sight the dwarf is an epitome of all the wonders of heaven the proud one has a soul worthy of a diadem the artful brims with wit the silly one is very good-natured the chatterbox is good-tempered and the silent one modest and reticent <laughs> thus a passionate swain loves even the very faults of those of whom he is enamoured and i maintain that let us drop the subject and take a turn or two in the gallery what are you going gentlemen no no, no, no madam. madam the fear of their departure troubles you very much go when you like gentlemen but i tell you beforehand that i shall not leave until you leave unless it inconveniences this lady i have nothing to call me elsewhere the whole day i provided i am present when the king retires i have no other matter to call me away solemne to alceste you only joke i fancy not at all we shall soon see whether it is me of whom you wish to get rid scene six alceste solemne eliante acaste Filinte, Clitandre, Basque. Basque to Alceste. There is a man downstairs, sir, who wishes to speak to you on business which cannot be postponed. 
tell him that i have no such urgent business he wears a jacket with large plated skirts embroidered with gold Selimine to alceste go and see who it is or else let him come in scene seven alceste Selimine, eliante acaste felinte clitandre a guard of the mare chaise alceste going to meet the guard what may be your pleasure come in sir i would have a few words privately with you sir you may speak aloud sir so as to let me know the marshals of france whose commands i bear hereby summon you to appear before them immediately sir whom me sir yourself and for what it is this ridiculous affair between you and orant what do you mean orant and he have been insulting each other just now about some trifling verses which he did not like and the marshals wish to nip the affair in the bud but i shall never show any base complacency but you must obey the summons come get ready how will they settle this between us will the edict of these gentlemen oblige me to approve of the verses which are the cause of our quarrel i will not retract what i have said i think them abominable but with a little milder tone i will not abate one jot the verses are execrable you ought to show some more accommodating spirit come along i shall go but nothing shall induce me to retract go and show yourself unless an express order from the king himself commands me to approve of the verses which cause all this trouble i shall ever maintain egad that they are bad and that a fellow deserves hanging for making them to clitandre and acaste who are laughing hang it gentlemen i did not think i was so amusing go quickly whether you are wanted i am going madam but shall come back here to finish our discussion end of act two act three of the misanthrope by moliere translated by henri van luan this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One, Clitandre Acaste. My dear Marquis, you appear mightily pleased with yourself. Everything amuses you, and nothing discomposes you. But really and truly, think you, without flattering yourself, that you have good reasons for appearing so joyful. <laughs> I do not find on looking at myself any matter to be sorrowful about. I am wealthy, I am young, and descend from a family which, with some appearance of truth, may be called noble. And I think that, by the rank which my lineage confers upon me, there are very few offices to which I might not aspire. <laughs> oh, as for courage, which we ought especially to value, it is well known, this without vanity, that I do not like it, and people have seen me carry on an affair of honour in a manner sufficiently vigorous and brisk. As for wit, I have some, no doubt, and as for good taste, to judge and reason upon everything without study. At first night, of which I am very fond, to take my place as a critic upon the stage, to give my opinion as a judge, to applaud and point out the best passages by repeated bravos, I am sufficiently adroit. I carry myself well, and am good-looking, have particularly fine teeth, and a good figure. I believe, without flattering myself, that as for dressing and good taste, very few will dispute the palm with me. <laughs> I find myself treated with every possible consideration, very much beloved by the fair sex, and I stand very well with the king. With all that, I think, dear Marquis, that one might be satisfied with oneself anywhere. True, but finding so many easy conquests elsewhere, why come you here to utter fruitless sighs? 
I? Zounds! I have neither the wish nor the disposition to put up with indifference of any woman. I leave it to awkward and ordinary people to burn constantly for cruel fair maidens, to languish at their feet, and to bear with their severities, to invoke the aid of sighs and tears, and to endeavour, by long and persistent assiduities, to obtain what is denied to their little merit. But men of my stamp, Marquis, are not made to love on trust, and be at all the expenses themselves. Be the merit of the fair ever so great, I think, thank heaven, <laughs> that we have our value as well as they, that it is not reasonable to enthrall a heart like mine without its costing them anything, and that, to weigh everything in a just scale, the advances should be at least reciprocal. Then you think that you are right enough here, Marquis? I have some reason, Marquis, to think so. Believe me, divest yourself of this great mistake. You flatter yourself, dear friend, and are altogether self-deceived. <laughs> it is true. I flatter myself, and am, in fact, altogether self-deceived. But what causes you to judge your happiness to be complete? I flatter myself. Upon what do you ground your belief? I am altogether self-deceived. Have you any sure proofs? I am mistaken, I tell you. Has Solomon made you any secret avowal of her inclinations? No. I am very badly treated by her. Answer me, I pray. I meet with nothing but rebuffs. A truce to your raillery, and tell me what hope she has held out to you. I am the rejected, and you are the lucky one. She is a great aversion to me. And one of these days I shall have to hang myself. Nonsense. Shall we two, Marquis, to adjust our love affairs, make a compact together? Whenever one of us shall be able to show a certain proof of having the greater share in Salomon's heart, the other shall leave the field free to the supposed conqueror, and by that means rid him of an obstinate rival. Egad, you please me with these words, and I agree to that from the bottom of my heart. But, hush. Scene two, Solemne, Acaste, Clitandre. What? Here still? Love, madam, detains us. I hear a carriage below. Do you know whose it is? No. Scene three, Solemne, Acaste, Clitandre, Basque. Arsinoe, madame, is coming up to see you. What does the women want with me? Iliant is downstairs talking to her. What is she thinking about? And what brings her here? She has everywhere the reputation of being a consummate prude and her fervent zeal. Pshaw! Downright humbug! In her inmost soul, she is as worldly as any, and her every nerve is strained to hook someone, without being successful, however. She can only look with envious eyes on the accepted lovers of others and in her wretched condition forsaken by all she is for ever railing against the blindness of the age she endeavours to hide the dreadful isolation of her home under a false cloak of prudishness and to save the credit of her feeble charms she brands as criminal the power which they lack yet a swain would not come at all amiss to the lady and she has even a tender hankering after alceste every attention that he pays me she looks upon as a theft committed by me, and as an insult to her attractions, and her jealous spite, which she can hardly hide, breaks out against me at every opportunity, and in an underhand manner. In short, I never saw anything, to my fancy, so stupid. She is impertinent to the last degree. Scene 4. Arsinoe, Solemne, Clitandre, Acaste. Ah! What happy chance brings you here, madam? I was really getting uneasy about you. I have come to give you some advice, as a matter of duty. How very glad I am to see you! Exeunt, Clitandre and Acaste, laughing. Scene 5. Arsinoe, Solemne. They could not have left at a more convenient opportunity. Shall we sit down? It is not necessary. Friendship, madam, 
must especially show itself in matters which may be of consequence to us and as there are none of greater importance than honour and decorum i come to prove to you by an advice which closely touches your reputation the friendship which i feel for you yesterday i was with some people of rare virtue where the conversation turned upon you and there your conduct which is causing some stir was unfortunately madam far from being commended that crowd of people whose visits you permit your gallantry and the noise it makes were criticised rather more freely and more severely than i could have wished you can easily imagine whose part i took i did all i could to defend you i exonerated you and vouched for the purity of your heart and the honesty of your intentions but you know there are things in life which one cannot well defend although one may have the greatest wish to do so and i was at last obliged to confess that the way in which you lived did you some harm that in the eyes of the world it had a doubtful look that there was no story so ill-natured as not to be everywhere told about it and that if you liked your behaviour might give less cause for censure not that i believe that decency is in any way outraged heaven forbid that i should harbour such a thought but the world is so ready to give credit to the faintest shadow of a crime and it is not enough to live blameless oneself madam i believe you to be too sensible not to take in good part this useful counsel and not to ascribe it only to the inner promptings of an affection that feels an interest in your welfare madam i have a great many thanks to return you such counsel lays me under an obligation and far from taking it to miss i intend this very moment to repay the favour by giving you an advice which also touches your reputation closely and as i see you prove yourself my friend by acquainting me with the stories that are current of me i shall follow so nice an example by informing you what is said of you in a house the other day where i paid a visit i met some people of exemplary merit who while talking of the proper duties of a well-spent life turned the topic of the conversation upon you madam there your prudishness and your too fervent zeal were not at all cited as a good example this affectation of a grave demeanour your eternal conversations on wisdom and honour your mincings and mouthings are the slightest shadows of indecency which an innocent though ambiguous word may convey that lofty esteem in which you hold yourself and those pitying glances which you cast upon all your frequent lectures and your acrid censures on things which are pure and harmless all this if i may speak frankly to you madam was blamed unanimously what is the good said they of this modest mien and this prudent exterior which is belied by all the rest she says her prayers with the utmost exactness but she beats her servants and pays them no wages she displays great fervour in every place of devotion but she paints and wishes to appear handsome she covers the nudities in her pictures but loves the reality as for me i undertook your defence against every one and positively assured them that it was nothing but scandal but the general opinion went against me and they came to the conclusion that you would do well to concern yourself less about the actions of others and take a little more pains with your own that one ought to look a long time at oneself before thinking of condemning other people that when we wish to correct others we ought to add the weight of a blameless life and that even them it would be better to leave it to those whom heaven has ordained for the task madam i also believe you to be too sensible not to take in good part this useful counsel and not to ascribe it only to the inner promptings of an affection that feels an interest in your welfare oh, to whatever we may be exposed when we reprove i did not expect this retort madam and by its very sting i see how my sincere advice has hurt your feelings on the contrary madam and if we are reasonable those mutual counsels would become customary if honestly made use of 
it would to a great extent destroy the excellent opinion people have of themselves it depends entirely on you whether we shall continue this trustworthy practice with equal zeal and whether we shall take great care to tell each other between ourselves what we hear you of me i of you ah madam i can hear nothing said of you it is in me that people find so much to reprove madam it is easy i believe to blame or praise everything and every one may be right according to their age and taste there is a time for gallantry there is one also for prudishness one may out of policy take to it when youthful attractions have faded away it sometimes serves to hide vexatious ravages of time i do not say that i shall not follow your example one of these days those things come with old age but twenty as every one well knows is not an age to play the prude you certainly pride yourself upon a very small advantage and you boast terribly of your age whatever difference there may be between your years and mine there is no occasion to make such a tremendous fuss about it and i am at a loss to know madam why you should get so angry and what makes you goad me in this manner and i madam am at an equal loss to know why one hears you inveigh so bitterly against me everywhere oh must i always suffer for your vexations can i help it if people refuse to pay you any attentions if men will fall in love with me and will persist in offering me each day those attentions of which your heart would wish to see me deprived i cannot alter it and it is not my fault i leave you the field free and do not prevent you from having charms to attract people alas and do you think that i would trouble myself about this crowd of lovers of which you are so vain and that it is not very easy to judge at what price they may be attracted nowadays do you wish to make it be believed that judging by what is going on your merit alone attracts this crowd that their affection for you is strictly honest and that it is for nothing but your virtue that they all pay you their court people are not blinded by these empty pretences the world is not duped in that way and i see many ladies who are capable of inspiring a tender feeling yet who do not succeed in attracting a crowd of beaux and from that fact we may draw our conclusion that these conquests are not altogether made without some great advances that no one cares to sigh for us for our handsome looks only and that the attentions bestowed on us are generally dearly bought do not therefore puff yourself up with vainglory about the trifling advantages of a poor victory and moderate slightly the pride on your good looks instead of looking down upon people on account of them if i were at all envious about your conquests i dare say that i might manage like other people be under no restraint and thus show plainly that one may have lovers when one wishes for them do have some then madam and let us see you try it endeavour to please by the extraordinary secret and without let us break off this conversation madam it might excite too much both your temper and mine and i would have already taken my leave had i not been obliged to wait for my carriage please stay as long as you like and do not hurry yourself on that account madam but instead of wearying you any longer with my presence i am going to give you some more pleasant company this gentleman who comes very opportunely will better supply my place in entertaining you scene six alceste solemne arsinoe alceste i have to write a few lines which i cannot well delay please to stay with this lady she will all the more easily excuse my rudeness scene seven alceste arsinoe you see i am left here to entertain you until my coach comes round as she could have devised no more charming treat for me than such a conversation indeed people of exceptional merit attract the esteem and love of every one and yours has undoubtedly some secret charm that makes me feel interested in all your doings 
i could wish that the court with a real regard to your merits would do more justice to your deserts you have reason to complain and it vexes me to see that day by day nothing is done for you for me madam and by what right could i pretend to anything what service have i rendered to the state pray what have i done so brilliant in itself to complain of the court doing nothing for me not every one whom the state delights to honour has rendered signal services there must be an opportunity as well as the power and the abilities which you allow us to perceive at for heaven's sake let us have no more of my abilities i pray what would you have the court to do it would have enough to do and have its hands full to discover the merits of people sterling merit discovers itself a great deal is made of yours in certain places and let me tell you that not later than yesterday you were highly spoken of in two distinguished circles by people of very great standing as for that madam every one is praised nowadays and very little discrimination is shown in our times everything is equally endowed with great merit so that it is no longer an honour to be lauded praises abound they throw them at one's head and even my valet is put in the gazette as for me i could wish that to bring yourself into greater notice some place at court might tempt you if you only give me a hint that you seriously think about it a great many engines might be set in motion to serve you and i know some people whom i could employ for you and who would manage the matter smoothly enough hmm. and what should i do when i got there madam my disposition rather prompts me to keep away from it heaven when ushering me into the world did not give me a mind suited for the atmosphere of a court i have not the qualifications necessary for success nor for making my fortune there to be open and candid is my chief talent i possess not the art of deceiving people in conversation and he who has not the gift of concealing his thoughts ought not to stay long in those places when not at court one has not doubtless that standing and the advantage of those honourable titles which it bestows nowadays but on the other hand one has not the vexation of playing the silly fool one is not to bear a thousand galling rebuffs one is not as it were forced to praise the verses of mr so-and-so to laud madam such-and-such and to put up with the whims of some ingenuous marquis since you wish it let us drop the subject of the court but i cannot help grieving for your amours and to tell you my opinions candidly on that head i could heartily wish your affections better bestowed you certainly deserve a much happier fate and she who has fascinated you is unworthy of you but in saying so madam remember i pray that this lady is your friend true but really my conscience revolts at the thought of suffering any longer the wrong that is done to you the position in which i see you afflicts my very soul and i caution you that your affections are betrayed this is certainly showing me a deal of good feeling madam and such information is very welcome to a lover yes for all selimen is my friend i do not hesitate to call her unworthy of possessing the heart of a man of honour and hers only pretends to respond to yours <sighs> that is very possible madam one cannot look into the heart but your charitable feelings might well have refrained from awakening such a suspicion as mine nothing is easier than to say no more about it if you do not wish to be undeceived just so but whatever may be openly said on this subject is not half so annoying as hints thrown out and i for one would prefer to be plainly told 
that only which could be clearly proved very well and that is sufficient i can fully enlighten you upon the subject i will have you believe nothing but what your own eyes see only have the kindness to escort me as far as my house and i will give you undeniable proof of the faithlessness of your fair one's heart and if after that you can find some charms in any one else we will perhaps find you some consolation End of Act Three. Act Four of *The Misanthrope* by Moliere, translated by Henri von Luan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four, Scene One, Eliante Felinte no never have i seen so obstinate a mind nor a reconciliation more difficult to effect in vain was alceste tried on all sides he would still maintain his opinion and never i believe has a more curious dispute engaged the attention of those gentlemen no gentlemen exclaimed he i will not retract and i shall agree with you on every point except on this one at what is Orant offended? And with what does he reproach me? Does it reflect upon his honor that he cannot write well? What is my opinion to him, which he has altogether wrongly construed? One may be a perfect gentleman and write bad verses. Those things have nothing to do with honor. I take him to be a gallant man in every way, a man of standing, of merit and courage, anything you like. But he is a wretched author. I shall praise, if you wish, his mode of living, his lavishness, his skill in riding, in fencing, in dancing. But as to praising his verses, I am his humble servant, and if one has not the gift of composing better, one ought to leave off rhyming altogether, unless condemned to do it on forfeit of one's life. In short, all the modification they could with difficulty obtain from him was to say, in what he thought a much gentler tone i am sorry sir to be so difficult to please and out of regard for you i would wish with all my heart to have found your sonnet a little better and they compelled them to settle this dispute quickly with an embrace he is very eccentric in his doings but i must confess that i think a great deal of him and the candour upon which he prides himself has something noble and heroic in it it is a rare virtue nowadays and i for one should not be sorry to meet with it everywhere as for me the more i see of him the more i am amazed at that passion to which his whole heart is given up i cannot conceive how with a disposition like his he has taken it into his head to love at all and still less can I understand how your cousin happens to be the person to whom his feelings are inclined. That shows that love is not always produced by compatibility of temper, and in this case all the pretty theories of gentle sympathies are belied. But do you think him beloved in return, to judge from what we see? <laughs> that is a point not easily decided. How can we judge whether it be true she loves? her own heart is not so very sure of what it feels it sometimes loves without being quite aware of it and at other times thinks it does without the least grounds i think that our friend will have more trouble with this cousin of yours than he imagines and to tell you the truth if he were of my mind he would bestow his affections elsewhere and by a better choice we should see him madam profit by the kind feelings which your heart evinces for him as for me i do not mince matters and i think that in such cases we ought to act with sincerity i do not run counter to his tender feelings on the contrary i feel interested in them and if it depended only on me i would unite him to the object of his love but if as it may happen in love affairs his affections should receive a check and if silly men should respond to the love of any one else, 
i could easily be prevailed upon to listen to his addresses and i should have no repugnance whatever to them on account of their rebuff elsewhere nor do i from my side oppose myself madam to the tender feelings which you entertain for him and he himself if he wished could inform you what i have taken care to say to him on that score but if by the union of those two you should be prevented from accepting his attentions all mine would endeavour to gain that great favour which your kind feelings offer to him only too happy madam to have them transferred to myself if his heart could not respond to yours you are in the humour to jest Philand. not so madam i am speaking my inmost feelings i only wait the opportune moment to offer myself openly and am wishing most anxiously to hurry its advent scene two alceste eliante felinte ah madam obtain me justice for an offence which triumphs over all my constancy what ails you what disturbs you this much ails me that it is death to me to think of it and the upheaving of all creation would less overwhelm me than this accident it is all over with me my love i cannot speak just endeavour to be composed oh just heaven must so many charms be allied to most odious vices of the most perfidious hearts but once more what can have alas all is ruined i am i am betrayed i am stricken to death Solomon, would you credit it Solomon deceives me and is faithless have you just grounds for believing so perhaps it is a suspicion rashly conceived and your jealous temper often harbours fancies ah sadeth please to mind your own business sir to eliante her treachery is but too certain for i have my pocket a letter in her own handwriting yes madam a letter intended for a rant has placed before my eyes my disgrace and her shame a rant whose addresses i believe she avoided and whom of all my rivals i feared the least a letter may deceive by appearances and is sometimes not so culpable as may be thought once more sir leave me alone if you please and trouble yourself only about your own concerns you should moderate your passion and the insult you must be left to do that madam it is to you that my heart has recourse to-day to free itself from this goading pain avenge me on an ungrateful and perfidious relative who basely deceives such constant tenderness avenge me for an act that ought to fill you with horror i avenge you how by accepting my heart take it madam instead of the false one it is in this way that i can avenge myself upon her and i shall punish her by the sincere attachment and the profound love the respectful cares the eager devotions the ceaseless attentions which this heart will henceforth offer up at your shrine i certainly sympathize with you in your sufferings and i do not despise your proffered heart but the wrong done may not be so great as you think and you might wish to forego this desire for revenge when the injury proceeds from a beloved object we form many designs which we never execute we may find as powerful a reason as we like to break off the connection the guilty charmer is soon again innocent all the harm we wish her quickly vanishes and we know what a lover's anger means no no madam no the offence is too cruel there will be no relenting and i have done with her nothing shall change the resolution i have taken and i should hate myself for ever loving her again here she comes 
my anger increases at her approach i shall taunt her with her black guilt completely put her to the blush and after that bring you a heart wholly freed from her deceitful attractions scene three solemne alceste alceste aside grant heaven that i may control my temper Selimine aside oh to alceste what is all this trouble that i see you in and what mean those long-drawn sighs and those black looks which you cast at me that all the wickedness of which a heart is capable is not to be compared to your perfidy that neither fate hell nor heaven in its wrath ever produced anything so wicked as you are these are certainly pretty compliments which i admire very much do not jest this is no time for laughing blush rather you have cause to do so and i have undeniable proofs of your treachery this is what the agitations of my mind prognosticated it was not without cause that my love took alarm by these frequent suspicions which were hateful to you i was trying to discover the misfortune which my eyes have beheld and in spite of all your care and your skill in dissembling my star foretold me what i had to fear but do not imagine that i will bear unavenged the slight of being insulted i know that we have no command over our inclinations that love will everywhere spring up spontaneously that there is no entering a heart by force and that every soul is free to name its conqueror i should thus have no reason to complain if you had spoken to me without dissembling and rejected my advances from the very beginning my heart would then have been justified in blaming fortune alone but to see my love encouraged by deceitful avowal on your part is an action so treacherous and perfidious that it cannot meet with too great a punishment and i can allow my resentment to do anything yes yes after such an outrage fear everything i am no longer myself i am mad with rage my senses struck by the deadly blow with which you kill me are no longer governed by reason i give way to the outburst of a just wrath and am no longer responsible for what i may do whence comes i pray such a passion speak have you lost your senses yes yes i lost them when to my misfortune i beheld you and thus took the poison which kills me and when i thought to meet with some sincerity in those treacherous charms that bewitched me of what treachery have you to complain ah how double-faced she is how well she knows how to dissemble but i am fully prepared with a means of driving her to extremities cast your eyes here and recognize your writing this picked-up note is sufficient to confound you and such proof cannot easily be refuted and this is the cause of your perturbation of spirits you do not blush on beholding this writing and why should i blush what you add boldness to craft will you disown this note because it bears no name why should i disown it since i wrote it and you can look at it without becoming confused at the crime of which its style accuses you you are in truth a very eccentric man what you thus outbrave this convincing proof and the contents so full of tenderness for a rant need have nothing in them to outrage me or to shame you a rant who told you that this letter is for him 
the people who put it into my hands this day. But I will even suppose that it is for someone else. Has my heart any less cause to complain of yours? Will you, in fact, be less guilty toward me? But if it is a woman to whom this letter is addressed, how can it hurt you? Or what is there culpable in it? Hum. The prevarication is ingenious, and the excuse excellent. I must own that I did not expect this turn, and nothing but that was wanting to convince me. Do you dare to have recourse to such palpable tricks? Do you think people entirely destitute of common sense? <sighs> Come, let us see a little by what subterfuge, with what air, you will support so palpable a falsehood, and how you can apply to a woman every word of this note, which invinces so much tenderness. Reconcile, if you can, to hide your deceit, what I am about to read. It does not suit me to do so. I think it ridiculous that you should take so much upon yourself, and tell me, to my face, what you have the daring to say to me. No, no. Without flying into a rage, take a little trouble to explain these terms. No, I shall do nothing of the kind, and it matters very little to me what you think upon the subject. I pray you, show me, and I shall be satisfied, if this letter can be explained as meant for a woman. Not at all. It is for a rent, and I will have you believe it. I accept all his attentions gladly. I admire what he says. I like him, and I shall agree to whatever you please. Do as you like, and act as you think proper. Let nothing hinder you, and do not harass me any longer. Alceste, aside. Heavens! Can anything more cruel be conceived? And was ever heart treated like mine? What? I am justly angry with her. I come to complain and I am quarrelled with instead. My grief and my suspicions are excited to the utmost. I am allowed to believe everything. She boasts of everything, and yet my heart is still sufficiently mean not to be able to break the bonds that hold it fast, and not to arm itself with a generous contempt for the ungrateful object of which it is too much enamoured. To Salemine. Perfidious woman. You know well how to take advantage against myself of my great weakness, and to employ for your own purpose that excessive, astonishing, and fatal love which your treacherous looks have inspired. Defend yourself at least from a crime that overwhelms even me, and cease that affectation of being culpable against me. Show me, if you can, the innocence of this note. My affection will even consent to assist you. At any rate, endeavor to appear faithful, and I shall strive to believe you such. Oh, you are mad with your jealous frenzies, and do not deserve the love which I have for you. I should much like to know what could compel me to stoop for you to the baseness of dissembling, and why, if my heart were disposed toward another, I should not say so candidly. What? Does the kind assurance of my sentiments towards you not defend me sufficiently against all your suspicions? Ought they to possess any weight at all with such a guarantee? Is it not insulting me even to listen to them? And since it is with the utmost difficulty that we can resolve to confess our love, since the strict honour of our sex, hostile to our passion, strongly opposes such a confession, Ought a lover who sees such an obstacle overcome for his sake doubt with impunity our avowal? And is he not greatly to blame in not assuring himself of the truth of that which is never said, but after a severe struggle with oneself? Be gone! Such suspicions deserve my anger, and you are not worthy of being cared for. I am silly, and am vexed at my own simplicity in still preserving the least kindness for you. I ought to place my affections elsewhere, and give you a just cause for complaint. Ah, you traitress! Mine is a strange infatuation for you. 
<sighs> Those tender expressions are, no doubt, meant only to deceive me. But it matters little. I must submit to my fate. My very soul is wrapped up in you. I will see to the bitter end how your heart will act towards me, and whether it will be black enough to deceive me. No, you do not love me as you ought to love. Indeed, nothing is to be compared to my exceeding love, and in its eagerness to show itself to the whole world, it goes even so far as to form wishes against you. Yes, I could wish that no one thought you handsome, that you were reduced to a miserable existence, that heaven, at your birth, had bestowed upon you nothing, that you had no rank, no nobility, no wealth, so that I might openly proffer my heart, and thus make amends to you for the injustice of such a lot, and that, this very day, I might have the joy and the glory of seeing you owe everything to my love. This is wishing me well in a strange way. Heaven grant that you may never have occasion. But here comes Monsieur de Bois, curiously decked out. Scene four. Solemne, Alceste, Dubois. What means this strange attire and that frightened look? What ails you? Sir. Well? The most mysterious event. What is it? Our affairs are turning out badly, sir. What? Shall I speak out? Yes. Do in quickly. Is there no one there? Curse your trifling. Will you speak? Sir, we, we must be to retreat. What do you mean? We must steal away from this quietly. And why? I tell you that we must leave this place. The reason? We must go, sir, without staying to take leave. But what is the meaning of this strain? The meaning is, sir, that you must make yourself scarce. I shall knock you on the head to a certainty. Booby, if you do not explain yourself more clearly. A fellow, sir, with a black dress, and as black a look, got as far as the kitchen to leave a paper with us, scribbled over in such a fashion that old Nick himself could not have read it. It is about your lawsuit, I make no doubt, but the very devil, I believe, could not make head nor tail of it. Well, what then? What has the paper to do with the going away of which you speak, you scoundrel? I, I must tell you, sir, that about an hour afterwards, a gentleman who often calls came to ask for you quite eagerly, and not finding you at home, quietly told me, knowing how attached I am to you, to let you know. Stop a moment. What, what the deuce is his name? Never mind his name, you scoundrel, and tell me what he told you. He is one of your friends. In short, that is sufficient. He told me that for your very life you must get away from this, and that you are threatened with arrest. But how? Has he not specified anything? No, he has asked me for ink and paper, and has sent you a line for which you can, I think, fathom the mystery. Hand it over, then. What can all this mean? I do not know, but I am anxious to be informed. Have you almost done devil take you? Dubois, after having fumbled for some time for the note. Um, uh, let, let's see, uh, where, um, you yeah, are, uh, oh, ah, uh, yeah. After all, sir, I have left it on your table. I do not know what keeps me from. Do not put yourself in a passion, but go and unravel this perplexing business. It seems that fate, whatever I may do, has sworn to prevent my having a conversation with you. But to get the better of her, Allow me to see you again, madam, before the end of the day. End of Act 4